Thanks so much, John. Yeah, love John Hammer, Dan Hammer. It's so good to be here. And thanks for your leadership in worship, such a tenderness in worship. I was thinking, maybe I shouldn't speak this morning. Maybe I should just zip it and uh, worship in the altar area, and that would be a win for me. Uh, But we believe in the power of the Word, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. Grateful for... uh, Pastor Dan Hammer's friendship and mentorship over the years. And even I was saying, I think maybe at the Sin Network, maybe at Man Cave, who knows, it's all a blur. You know, you get jet lag when you drive down I-5 from Canada. Uh, (laughs) But I remember coming here in a season of transition where I'd been beat up in ministry, which is never happy. You know, there's a shocker that sometimes the place that you get your teeth kicked in is the church. So, so let's name it. And that's not God's heart. That's not God's design. So I kind of came dragging my carcass in here. And uh, pa- Pastor Dan, who is like Mr. Two Altar Calls, you know, <laughs> one before he preaches and one after he preaches, he just wants to make sure that no lost sheep get out of the fold, that he can gather them in or he can throw out his gospel dragnet and get a whole bunch of fish. So why not do two altar calls? I'm going to start doing that. I might do three just to warm up you and, and uh, reap a greater harvest for the glory of God in a season of increase and abundance. Hallelujah. But he gave an altar call for people to come forward for prayer. And I went, oh, no, the Lord wants me to go forward. Oh, shucks. And I was way at the back before some lunatics uh, ripped away the walls. So I was back where those pillars are. And I had to come right from the back to the front, which is a good spiritual exercise in humiliation. (laughs) Because it takes a lot of humiliation to create just a teeny weeny bit of humility. And uh, God honors humility because he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So I came out, and I was maybe standing here, just in a posture of receiving. And Pastor Dan's up there directing traffic, like the air traffic controller, moving prayer people around. And everybody sat down apart from me. Spirit was all over me. And somebody stuck with me, a prayer person stuck with me. But I think Dan didn't really appreciate the distraction So he looked at me, named me, prophesied over me, and I collapsed right there and just lay out there. I have no idea what you were speaking on. I don't think it was that good anyway, but but I was just like, I was just laid out there. And when you get hurt by others, your trust apparatus gets fried because Really, you can't trust human beings, especially English people. You can't trust human beings, but you can trust Jesus. He's always faithful and true and kind. He always keeps his promises. And as I stood up, I was refreshed and my trust apparatus was restored. So it's a beautiful place of encounter And this morning, this is a place of encounter where you can encounter the true and living God. You might be someone who's been following Jesus for years and years and years, but our Father is a how much more God, and you can encounter Him in a fresh way, in a new way. You may have been kidnapped this morning from your apartment and dragged kicking and screaming by two men who are stronger than you and bundled in the trunk of their car and brought to church this morning. And you say, what's wrong with these friends of mine? They knew today is your day of destiny. Today is a day of encounter. Today is a day of appointment. And we're going to give you an opportunity tonight to encounter God. But this morning we're here. And this is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. And that word salvation is a big word. It's a big word. It means saved, healed, restored, delivered. And the good news is you don't have to have a very comprehensive theology. All you need to do is follow this scripture. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be delivered. So there'll be breakthrough, salvation, healing, 
transformation in Jesus' name. As John said, and I love John dearly, and I appreciate him so very much. He's a firecracker. You're blessed to have a passionate, gospel-centered, spirit-filled leader as your lead pastor. Because lots of pulpits don't lift up Jesus. Lots of ministries are focused on big dog rather than the king of kings. So I appreciate his heart for Jesus. And here's a little secret that he shared at the Send Network. We used to do talk radio. I was the host. Nathan Johnson was there, and I called them Pinky and the Brain. And you can guess which one Pastor John was. <laughs> but he wasn't the brain. Oh. <laughs> Although he is very intelligent, he's very smart, he's studying theology, he knows stuff. So as he mentioned, and I'll talk a bit more about this tonight, I lead a ministry called Message Canada that's part of a global movement, and we're seeing some wild and crazy things. So in Canada, we're in Canada that is so post-Christian, it's pre-Christian, populated by secular moralists, where back in 1961, one half of 1% of Canadians said, we have no religious affiliation whatsoever. Now about 40% of Canadians would say that. We have the most unreached piece of real estate in all of the Americas, the province of Quebec, which is less than 0.5% evangelical. Now, by comparison, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan is 0.6% evangelical. Now, God's heart and kingdom is bigger than the evangelical tribe, but that gives you an indicator that this land that you will hit in one hour and 42 minutes, if you drive up I-5 quicker, if you put the foot down, <laughs> is a gospel-parched mission field. And so in Canada... We're raising up evangelists. We're partnering with a ministry where we'll gather over 300 evangelists in Quebec City in February for encouragement. And that'll be francophone. So that'll be tough for a Scotsman because je me perds beau et je parle français un petit peu. Pourquoi? Je suis écossais. And the problem is, when I say that with my best inspector Clouseau, do you have a room? When I, <laughs> they actually think I'm Franco-fluent, and I'm not. So if I don't have an interpreter in Quebec City, I am hooped. And I was there for the evangelist forum in February, and there was a guy speaking on wokeisme. Wokeisme, the problem of wokeisme. And I could understand what wokeisme, but everything else... Phew, my translator had left me in the dust. <laughs> but God's doing something unique in that province. And we have a, an ambassador there who's activating evangelism. So please pray for us. Join Jesus and obey his exhortation in Luke 10 to ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. So we're raising up evangelists, encouraging the church in evangelism, deploying teams of downwardly mobile urban missionaries to relocate or return to or rise up from within broken zip codes, broken postal codes is what we say in Canada, challenging neighborhoods where crime and addiction is rife, where sorrow and sadness is a pandemic, and we bring the hope of the gospel, and we're going to launch a creative ministry. So that's the Canadian story, but globally, you know, if you if you got your gospel perspective from Canada's challenges, you would be a sad individual. But God's doing something unique. In the history of the church that Jesus founded, we've never seen such a harvest. It's a day of unprecedented harvest. And one of the things that God is doing in this day is elevating the evangelist, not for their notoriety, but for the exaltation of Jesus and the advancement of the gospel. In our global ministry of advance, has 12,000 groups of evangelists who meet for mutual sharpening in the gospel. Amazing, amazing. In 94 nations. Oh, wow. Frozen Presbyterians in the house. Wow. <laughs> Your wood must be wet. Your wood must be wet. Bring the fire. Your wood must be wet. And this year, up until May, these groups reported 
conservatively because we didn't want to blow at the numbers 200,000 salvations. With 77% of those respondents in a disciple-making relationship. But that's enough said. We need to turn to the Word. We need to turn to the Word. But God's on the move. We need your prayers. I'm grateful for a church like this. That it's all about Jesus and is a Spirit-filled family. But He fills you with the Spirit not so that you can sit there like a charismatic sponge. Bless me, bless me, more Lord, more Lord, more Lord. But so that you can penetrate the darkness in Jesus' name. So that you can offer hope and healing and deliverance in Jesus' name. If you'd like to turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 18, verse 24, and we'll read into Acts 19 a few verses. Now, some of you have already got there because you have an app on your phone. I forgive you. Uh, because God breathed a book, he did not barf an app. And uh, we're in Acts 18, verse 24. That's just to help you out, that's page 1109 in my Bible. And we're tracking with the missionary activity of that gospel pit bull, that church planting apostolic five tool baseball playing gospel ninja, the Apostle Paul on his missionary travels. And we parachute into verse 24 of Acts 18, which says, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Priscilla and Aquila heard him. And who were they? They were a couple of Paul's co-workers. Paul had a side gig making tents, so he'd always smell like leather or canvas, as well as being short and ugly. It was tough if you were the Apostle Paul. And this couple worked with them making tents. They were disciple makers, and they even gave the Apostle Paul accommodation. So that's who they were. When Apollos wanted to go to, ooh, I lost my place. Where was I, John? 24, 27. I'll take 27. Thank you. Yeah, I'll trust the pastor. You don't speak again in church. Okay, thank you. When Apollos <laughs> wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the Scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. But the intriguing thing, which we'll circle back to, is it says when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. What was going on there? We'll find out. Verse 1 of Acts 19 while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit after you believed? They answered, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism. They replied, Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So here's an unusual episode in the life and times of the primitive Jesus movement. And we could call this message Adventures in Missing the Point. <laughs> I lost my place there. So that was just a tiny example of where are we in the Bible? Adventures in Missing the Plot and Adventures in Missing the Point. We've got a cast of characters in this spiritual drama, unusual names, Aquila, Priscilla, a tag team teaching disciple making couple. We've got Paul, the great missionary pioneer, and Apollos, a learned man who came from a city with a world class library. And we're told that he had a thorough knowledge of the scriptures, but was actually operating with a spiritual deficit in his experience. Then we motor down to Acts 19, where it seems as if Paul ended up on a beach with 12 surfers from Ephesus. 
disciples who were a clueless bunch because he asked them a simple diagnostic question. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Some of us weaned on the King James Version. It says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, duh, we've never even heard of the Holy Spirit. Duh, have you heard the Holy Spirit? No, you do heard the Holy Spirit. And then Paul asked them, what baptism did you receive? And he tells them that John's baptism was actually a signpost to one greater than him, King Jesus, who wouldn't just dunk you in the water, he would dunk you in Holy Spirit and immerse you in fire. And so he points them to Jesus and then Paul immerses all 12 of them, one after the other, in the sea. And they're dunked as a watery identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But they still hadn't received what Paul was quizzing them about. And we'll get there. This morning, I want to invite you to respond to three questions. And the first question is this. Do you really know Jesus? Have you placed your trust in Jesus as your Lord, forgiver, rescuer, friend? Do you really know Jesus? I've got a friend. He's an evangelist, and his name is Ianus Iagonus. Now, that's a stupid name uh, <laughs> and a confusing name to put on a business card. He's Greek separate. And so, Ianus Iagonus is simply fancy, flighty language for John John. <laughs> but what grown man on the planet wants to be known as John John? <laughs> Here's my business card. I'm John John, the evangelist. <laughs> hello, uh, I hope you like me. And you say, hello, little John John. Do you need to go poo-poo? <laughs> Does John John need a onesie or a deuce? Do you need a little nap, John John? Go get blanky and why in a corner? I can bring you milk and cookies, little John John. So obviously, he wasn't going to present himself as John John. John John. But he goes by J. John. Now we're talking. Because all the holy ones don't have first names. They only have initials. D. Hammer, Apostle of God. <laughs> so maybe his business card says, J. John, Evangelist to the Solar System. <laughs> and J. John, several years ago, was in India, and he met Mother Teresa. Now, he's about five feet four. Mother Teresa is probably, was probably about four feet 11. She'd be taller, but nuns weren't allowed to wear high heels. Stilettos are strictly verboten. And so it was kind of the meeting of the titans. And Mother Teresa asked him a simple diagnostic question. Hello, Mr. J. John, do you know Jesus? He says, what? I tell people about Jesus. I'm an evangelist. She said, Mr. J. John, that isn't what I asked you. Do you know Jesus? And she took her crooked Romanian little finger and put it under his Greek separate nose. Do you know Jesus? And he was indignant. So he responded defensively the second time. I tell people about Jesus, you small, dim, little nun. And she said, do you know Jesus? and let it hang in the air. And he had the wisdom not to respond. That is the most foundational, definitive question that you will answer in your life, even if you live to be 103. Whether you're an adolescent or an adult or a middle-aged man who has never grown up and never will grow up, that's the defining question. Do you know Jesus? 
This is eternal life, to know God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Do you know him? You see a lot of people engaging with the Lord in worship here, expressive and demonstrative, and it's easy to slip into the shadows and just kind of percolate in the cheap seats and actually never come to a saving, transforming, life-giving encounter with Jesus. I've got a friend who went to be with Jesus a couple of years ago, and he was a preacher's kid who became an atheist high school history teacher. Then he met like a really fierce, in-your-face, gospel-preaching, hard-nosed evangelist, and he became a real Christian and found himself in the epicenter of the Jesus movement in Australia with all kinds of throwaway young people and outlaw biker gangs in his redemptive orbit. He founded a ministry called Christian Care and Communication Concern Limited, but he got more notoriety for another ministry he founded called God Squad Motorcycle Club. And he'd share the good news of Jesus with the Hells Angels and with the Toe Cutter Gang, so-called, if they don't like you, they will cut off your toes, just to be clear. And in their ministry, they saw lots of gospel transformation. And someone they met who was in prison encountered Jesus and wrote a poem that puts this question front and center. The poem is, do you really know him? Oh, you say that you know him, but you don't know him at all. The one that you tell me about lives in a picture on the wall. He's come from a plastic country where the sun shines all the time. I don't know who you worship, kid, but he ain't no friend of mine. My friend's eyes are gentle, but they're often filled with pain. He's no stranger to the backstreet baby, the alley and the lane. He's often found at parties with prostitutes and thieves. He's always there when you are there and always last to leave. When you put your arms around him, you feel the scars beneath his shirt, and you wonder why he loves you when you've caused him so much hurt. He's often tired and dirty, but you know that he's the boss, because when you take his hand, you feel the nail marks of the cross. He knocked around with criminals. He'd give everyone the time. Women and kids would flock to him. You know they'd stand in line, but the churchy types, they hated him. So they hanged him on the cross, but they hadn't figured one thing, baby. You just can't sack the boss. I knew as soon as he talked to me, he'd been where I had been. He'd seen the knife and felt the wound of every lonely scene. He'd been right alongside of me when I was sleeping on the ground. And when I ride my Harley, I know that he's around. So don't say that you know him when you don't know him at all. The one I love would never live in a picture on the wall. There's nothing false about him. There ain't no plastic tack. You know this friend I love so well has been to hell and back. Do you know him? Have you received Jesus to as many as received him? Gave ye the right to be called the children of God. If you haven't today, Put your life in Jesus' nail-scarred hands. Put your life in Jesus' nail-scarred hands. He's the rock of ages. He's the sage of sages. Put your life in Jesus' nail-scarred hands. In Godfather 3, Michael Corleone, who's taken over from Marlon Brando as the Godfather, is Don Corleone. There will be no act of vengeance. And he's taken over by El Pacino. And Al Pacino plays Michael Corleone, but he's haunted by the wickedness, the evil, the bloodshed, but he's unrepentant. He won't let go of his sin. He won't repent. And he has a conversation with a cardinal in a compound. And the cardinal tells him that forgiveness and redemption is available, but he won't take it because he's not willing to change. And at one point, The cardinal draws attention to a rock that's sitting in a pool or a birdbath in the compound. And he says, look at this stone. It has been lying in the water for a very long time, but the water has not penetrated it. Look. And because he's a buff cardinal, he breaks the rock in two. And of course, the inside of the rock is perfectly dry. 
and Cardinal Lamberto says, look, it's perfectly dry. The same thing has happened to men in Europe. For centuries, they've been surrounded by Christianity, but Christ has not penetrated. Christ does not live within them. So that's the first question. Everything else I say is really irrelevant if you haven't settled the first question. Has Christ penetrated your heart? Is he your redeemer, rescuer, savior, and center? If not, you can take simple stumbling step of faith, surrender to Jesus, and walk into the parking lot, a different man, a different woman, a different old codger, a different young person than who came to this gathering. Second question that clearly arises from this passage of Scripture, which is a vital question for us to settle in our lives and in this moment we are in. Have you had a definitive Holy Spirit baptism? So that's where Aquila and Priscilla were responding to in Apollos' life. Apollos was steeped in the Scriptures. And that's vitally important. Jesus said, you're my disciples. If you continue in my word, if you abide in my word, if you remain in my word, then my word remains in you. But he only knew John's baptism, which is Luke's code to say he needed another baptism because he only knew John's baptism. And out of all the gospel writers, Dr. Luke, who wrote the book of Luke, and the book of Acts, which are really one book interrupted by another gospel, has a peculiar interest in the activity of the Holy Spirit in his gospel. He's focused on the ministry of the Holy Spirit and how people experience the power, the presence, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And he uses language of the Spirit coming upon people. In other words, the Spirit descending on people. And this is something he's quietly obsessed about. He does have other obsessions like prayer. And he's got a unique sequence of snapshots on Jesus, the man of prayer. He does have a passion and a burden for the poor and the outsiders and the Gentiles, but he's kind of the gospel of the Holy Spirit. So it's not suddenly that we stumble into Holy Spirit activity, impartation, power, presence, baptism, and fullness in the book of Acts. It's been his concern all along. And Luke's language is very spirit explicit. And there's lots of records that we can gaze at where the Holy Spirit descends on people, coming upon people, including Jesus. So in Luke chapter 3, Jesus is at his baptism, and his half-cousin John's kind of unnerved by the prospect of baptizing the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world, the sinless, spotless one. And so he's going, hey, you should be baptizing me. I shouldn't be baptizing you. And Jesus says, stand down, little cuz. I've got to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And at his baptism, Jesus isn't passive. He's praying. And as he's praying, the heavens are ripped open and Father speaks and Father shouts from heaven, that's my boy. There's my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And the heavens are open. The Father speaking words of affirmation, affection over Jesus of Nazareth. And the Holy Spirit's so excited, he falls out of heaven. And he descends on Jesus in bodily form like a dove. Other episodes, spirit comes like a tornado, a hurricane, a fireball. But here, brrr, spirit descends like a dove. And he rests because he's at home with the sun. And from that place where Jesus is loved into mission by the Father and launched into mission, into his assignment by the power of the Holy Spirit, Luke tells us that Jesus is hurled into the wilderness. So there's a Greek word, ekbalo, referred to chucking out demons, palm. But the spirit ekbalos, whee, Jesus into the wilderness forcefully, sent by the power of the spirit. And we know he's in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy of our souls in the wilderness who attempts to assault 
Jesus' sense of identity and erode the words of affirmation that Father spoke over him. And that's still the satanic strategy. The same wants to undermine your identity as a blood-bought, dearly loved child of God whom God has set his love and affection on for time and eternity and will never rescind his declaration of love and affirmation because the Father's love is from everlasting to everlasting. So it's not surprising that you get that attack on your identity because that was Satan's strategy with Jesus. If you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, and Jesus recites Scripture from Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 8, maybe that's where he was in his Bible reading cycle with those laminated cards from Sunrise Christian Center. Well, you know, what will I read today? Okay, Father, let's do Deuteronomy 6, 7, and 8. That sounds good to me. And so he, he just gives torpedo, torpedo, torpedo from the Word of God into Satan's ugly skull. And then how does he return? He's not had food for 40 days. He's been wrestling with the evil one who's out to steal and kill and to destroy. But the Bible says he returns in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's led by the Spirit in the wilderness, returns from the wilderness, from the desert wastelands, full of the Spirit, in the power of the Spirit. And then he speaks in Nazareth, and he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Now, that's an experiential and a Christological word. Jesus is saying, I am the anointed king. I am the fulfillment of the prophecies about the servant of the Lord. I am the anointed one. He's the one who carries the Spirit without measure. But at the same time, it's a testimony to his experience. It's an existential word. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. And Luke summarizes Jesus' ministry as God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with Holy Spirit and power. And he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. God was with him. So the simple question is, if the eternal, uncreated Son of God who became fully human operated in the power of the Holy Spirit, what about you? What about me? What about us? What about we? If Jesus did not embark on his assignment until the Spirit descended on him, how much more you and I? The New Testament understanding is that Jesus' followers will enter into Holy Spirit life power, anointing, and fullness. And the gateway for that is a definitive baptism in the Holy Spirit. Donald Guthrie said, the believer's whole spiritual existence depends on the activity of the Holy Spirit. It involves a totally new mode of existence. Apollos was learned, confident, compelling communicator. We told he was a fierce debater. He spoke with precision, and forcefulness, but he knew only the baptism of John. In other words, he'd never experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit. He was a, a word person, but God is looking for word and spirit people. R.T. Kendall says there's been a silent divorce in the church, speaking generally between the word and the spirit. When there is a divorce, sometimes the children stay with the mother, sometimes with the father. In this divorce, you have those on the word side and those on the spirit side. What is the difference? Those on the word side stress earnestly contending for the faith once delivered to the saints, expository preaching, sound theology, rediscovering the doctrines of the Reformation, justification by faith, sovereignty of God. Until we get back to the word, the honor of God's name will not be restored. What is wrong with this emphasis? Nothing. It is exactly right, in my opinion. Those on the spirit side stress getting back to the book of Acts. Signs, wonders, miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit with places being shaken at prayer meetings, get in Peter's shadow, and you're healed. Lie to the Holy Spirit, and you're struck dead. Until we recover the power of the Spirit, the honor of God's name will not be restored. What is wrong with this emphasis? Nothing. It is exactly right, in my opinion. The problem is, neither will learn from each other. But if these two would come together, the simultaneous com combination would mean spontaneous combustion. And if Smith Wigglesworth's prophecy got it right, the world will be turned upside down again. 
And so Apollos was a word man who became a word and spirit man because Jesus baptized him in the Holy Spirit. What about those fledgling Ephesians? They were clueless. They were idiots. They had the collective IQ of a box of donuts. <laughs> but whether you're clued in, clued up, educated, uneducated isn't the issue. You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Paul laid hands on them because in the New Testament, there's a practice, which is part of Sunrise's culture, that you can lay hands on people. And there's a transmission, there's an impartation, there's a release, there's a coming upon of the Holy Spirit in a transformative way. And this is God's design. God's design. In Luke's gospel, Jesus tells the disciples, stay in Jerusalem till you're clothed with power from on high. Acts 1 verse 4, wait for the promise of my Father. Then there's a promise you will receive power when after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. What is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It's being immersed, soaked in the Holy Spirit. John baptized in water. Baptism Sunday, they won't do a little sprinkle like a Brill Cream baptism service, a little dabble, do you? They'll dunk you right under. If they question the validity of your conversion, they may keep you under. <laughs> and then you send a signal, yes, I, I really repent. And our many in churches, sometimes they're scared that people will backslide, so they just drown them. That's the way they do it. No turning back, no turning back. But baptism isn't a sprinkle, although the Spirit can come like refreshing rain. It's a right good dousing in God's empowering presence. And it's a baptism of power, of love, and of fire. Paul says to Timothy, God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, you little weasel. <laughs> He's given you a spirit of power, of love, of a strong mind, of self-control that's supernatural. And the Spirit can come upon you in different ways. My wife had a sovereign baptism in the Holy Spirit. We were part of a church that didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the pastor gave some kind of an altar call. And my wife, who I didn't even know at the time, didn't even notice her. What was I thinking? Why do you think I got glasses? And she came forward for prayer. The pastor's wife took her into a little side room. The Spirit of God just landed on her, and she began speaking in tongues. And the pastor's wife, who had a Pentecostal background, said this helpful theological comment, I think we both know what's happened here. <laughs> and she came out the side room, and then I noticed her, and I said, oh, yes, she shall be mine. Oh, yes, she shall be mine. She was glowing. She was radiant. The Spirit was all over her. I was an engineering student who grew up in a legalistic church. No fun, too much damn, and not enough mental. We were fundamentalists. We had all kinds of stupid rules and regulations. And the problem, when the gospel isn't articulated clearly, and when legalism is the subtext, it's an unnerving place to be. God, does God really like me? Has God fully accepted me? It's, it's trouble. And I was an engineering student, and I went into the cafeteria in the J block of our university because that's where all the cute computer babes were. And I was sitting eating my lunch, and I'd finished my lunch, and I'm leaving, and a guy comes up to me, introduced by someone I kind of knew, and said, Bill Hogme, Alan Taylor, Alan Taylor, Meet Bill Hawk. I said, hello, Alan Taylor. And he said, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? I thought, you are a complete nut job. <laughs> Captain Fruit Loops. You know, what about a social greeting instead of going for the jugular? So I said, well, I've been sanctified. And he says, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit with wide, weird saucer eyes? And I said, uh, he said, can I pray for you? I said, sure. We always say that. Hey, can I pray for you? Meaning, I'm not going to do it. So it's safe. So he said, can I pray for you? I said, sure you can. Okay, so okay, let's find an empty room. I thought, wow. So we went into an empty lecture room, and I'm sitting in a chair, 
and he's sitting in a chair. He puts his hand on my shoulder, which this is only a first date, so that was a problem. <laughs> and he began speaking in fluent Swahili with his eyes closed, but my eyes were opened. I'm like, what's going to happen next? And he's got his hands up to heaven, and he's speaking away in Swahili, Hindustani, something, Syrophoenician. And then he stops, and he speaks in Scottish King James. In not many days hence, if thou shaltest, receivest power from on high. Whoa. I left as quick as I could. <laughs> there was a hunger and a yearning inside me. I went home to pray, but my little prayer time with Jesus got interrupted. But I went to a church service at a church that was like a filling station for cessationists who wanted to come out the wilderness for charismatics and non-charismatics. It was the filling station. They had a deliverance ministry. Like if you were scared of pigeons, whoa, uh, they would set you free. That was one of their ministries. They didn't put that on the notice board. Come and be freed from the phobia of pigeons. <laughs> but they, they had a Saturday night service, and uh, the pastor got up to preach. I was there with my buddy who was also at the university. And he spoke from Acts 19 just briefly. It wasn't the message. It was just a brief little, hey, by the way, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe Jesus wants to baptize you in the Holy Spirit? And I get so excited, I punch my buddy in the ribs. I'm like, that's why I'm here. I actually got rebuked from the stage from just being out of control. No, that was a very measured punch in the ribs. They had an open time of prayer. Someone wandered around and laid hands on me, and it was like heat on my back. And then the resident prophetess got up to speak, and she spoke for like an hour. And I'm like, Lord, I've got to get this car borrowed back. Would you shut the prophetess up? Because I want to go to the after meeting and be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, the Lord finally had mercy. The wee woman sat down, stopped talking. And then the pastor said, come into the little room. And we want to pray for you. So I'm there and the saying, just receive from Jesus. Just focus on Jesus. Just receive. And saying other unhelpful, vague religious phrases. They pray for my buddy, and he just collapses in his chair with a face like an angel, and he's away in fluent Swahili. And I'm like, you dirty dog. <laughs> so the pastor's given me instructions, and eventually I'm quoting verses from choruses that we used to sing to try and focus on Jesus. And eventually that wasn't working. So I just said, Jesus, 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 Jesus pastor was a big boy, so it took him a moment or two to get out of his chair, and he came across the room towards me, and he said something that we might want to fact check theologically. He said, he has names in other languages, and then he placed his hands on me, and it was like electric current went through my body, and I opened my mouth, and I'm yodeling in fluent Swahili. Jesus had baptized me in the Holy Spirit, and that was a game changer. It was a game changer because I knew at a revelation of the Father's affection, there was a fresh hunger and thirst for God. There was an assurance and confidence that God had accepted me because a byproduct of the baptism in the Holy Spirit that we don't talk about is full assurance of faith. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, being sealing, sealed by the Spirit and baptized in the Spirit are synonymous. They're kind of like two sides of the same coin. I had a hunger for Scripture, an intimacy that I never had before with Jesus, a prayer language, and fresh boldness. And that was a game changer that elevated me out the shadows of legalism and gave me power and confidence in Jesus, in the Father, in the Spirit, and in the gospel. So whether you're clued up, clued in, or clueless, you need to experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's God's desire for you. It was God's desire for the Ephesian crew, for Apollos, who had yet to experience it, and it's God's plan and purpose for all of his people. But that story was long, long ago. I was an engineering student. I had hair back then. I also had snake hips back then. The old days. Couldn't fit one leg of those jeans on me now. So it's a long, long time ago. So it raises my final question, which is a brief question. What about now? 
What is the quality of your relationship with the Holy Spirit now? I'm so grateful to God for that encounter with Jesus and the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But what is the quality of your relationship with the Holy Spirit now? What is the quality of my relationship with the Spirit of the living God, whom God in fee called God's empowering presence? Are you enjoying the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit? Are you experiencing God's empowering presence? Or are you experiencing a spiritual short circuit and you need a fresh encounter? Because the Bible says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Eugene Peterson says, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Well, you can't put out the Spirit's fire because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. He's God, the Holy Spirit. But you can stifle and suppress the fire of the Spirit in your life. You say, how is that possible? Because right next door to that exhortation, do not quench the Holy Spirit, is do not treat prophecies with contempt. So if God speaks to you by direct revelation, speaks a prophetic word, and you ignore it, guess what you're doing? You're quenching the Spirit, and you're going, I wonder why the Lord seems so distant. And your wife or your husband says, I wonder why you're so grumpy. I say, that's my default mode. That's why I'm always grumpy. Yeah, didn't you remember seeing me in Snow White? I'm the one called grumpy. The Lord spoke prophetic words over me about Canada, and I didn't like them. Didn't like them. I wanted to come back to America. God bless America and no place else. And my wife who's very prophetic, and Scottish, which is a lethal combination. <laughs> Scots are blunt and unhelpful without the Spirit. And then you have a woman who loves Jesus, loves the truth, loves the Word of God, and who's prophetic. What hope do I have? <laughs> and she said, what's your problem, Sparky? <laughs> the Lord gave you two prophetic words, the same words from different people different places. Don't you think he's getting your attention and your attitude sucks? <laughs> and she was right. And she said, you know, anyone would be thrilled to receive what the Lord has spoken over you. Why are you resisting it? And some of you hear the Lord has spoken prophetic words and because it's disruptive to your life and your selfishness and your plans, you go, nah, have you got something else, Lord? And he will not say anything to you again, revelatorily, until you repent and say, Spirit of the living God, come upon me afresh. I receive what you said, even if it dislodges me from the place I am living in and the path I have chosen. I want to walk in your ways, in your wisdom, with your power, your anointing, and your unction. But you can also grieve the Holy Spirit. He's fierce like a flame, but he's gentle like a dove. R.T. Kendall has written a book on the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not about you and I becoming sensitive to the Spirit, but it's the theological idea that the third person of the triune Godhead has a unique sensitivity and a unique capacity to be put to flight. A capacity to be saddened, to be grieved, or to be offended. You go, how is that possible? Well, if you look in Ephesians 4, where it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you have been sealed for the day of redemption... Then he's talking about bitterness, anger, rage, unwholesome talk. And so some of us have had a rough life, a rough go of it. Some of us have fallen backwards into the wisdom of Jesus' prayer when he says, he taught us to pray, forgive us as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And we've got wounds lodged in our heart because others have sinned against us. And that's part of the fabric of the human story. But the challenge is, if we don't forgive, if we walk in bitterness, resentment, if we constantly rehearse the offenses, if 
we don't come to the foot of the cross and say, Lord, I despise these people and what they've done to me, and I know that's wrong but I want to release them. Give me the grace to release them. I want to forgive them. I don't want to nurse this offense. I want to disperse this offense. Then we will grieve the Spirit of God. Now, I believe we're in a new and better covenant where the anointing abides and the anointing remains, but there's no flow. There's no fullness. There's no power. There's no presence. There's no unction because of the power of bitterness unforgiveness and resentment. When I was in Youth for Christ in the USA as an evangelist, people were upset and offended by the senior VP, who at the time was a man called Bill Muir. And Bill Muir told a bunch of eager missionaries who wanted to work amongst lost American young people, here, let me give you some advice. He says, if you stick around in Youth for Christ long enough, someone will screw you you will get screwed. Now, some of the eager beavers who'd never heard a pastor use the word screw from the pulpit were freaking out at his use of language. So, don't blame me. <laughs> blame Bill Muir. But the possibility that in a missions agency that was dedicated to communicate in the good news of Jesus, that you'd be injured and hurt and screwed by others was jarring and unsettling. But the truth is our most profound places of heart often come within the family of God because our expectation is much more elevated. But either way, don't live in the shadows of bitterness, unforgiveness, and resentment. Bring it to Jesus today. Experience cleansing, release, and freedom today and a fresh infusion of Holy Spirit life. I'm going to pray and I'm going to invite you to respond, and I'll tell you what that looks like in a little moment. But Father, we love you. We thank you for your faithfulness, your goodness. We thank you for the sense of your tangible, conspicuous presence here in this place as we meet together. And we thank you that you offer us new life in Jesus. And we thank you that you don't offer us a self-improvement package. You offer us new life lived out of the overflow of a reservoir of Holy Spirit fullness and presence and power. We thank you that we can become dearly loved children of God and bask under the kiss of your acceptance, experiencing a new day. And we invite you now to stir us afresh and Holy Spirit, for you to descend upon us again and give us fresh revelation of Jesus, of his heart, of the Father's affection. And we pray that you would stir and stir in this room in Jesus' name. So the first question I asked back when I started speaking five hours ago was this. <laughs> Do you really know Jesus? And so I'm going to lead you in a response that will help you settle that question for the here and now and for all of eternity. And I'd invite you to follow me in a prayer. And I'll lead you in a prayer. The words aren't magical, although they're better than American words because they're Scottish words. <laughs> but if you want to receive Jesus Christ and you know you've never experienced the kiss of God's acceptance, the power of full forgiveness, the new life that Jesus offers, this is your moment of destiny and I'd lead you in a prayer, and you can invite Jesus. Say, I, I want to receive Jesus. Jesus, I want you to receive me. Receive me, Jesus. I come to you. You say, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden and frayed at the edges and burnt out and stressed and who can't cope, and I'll give you rest in the new life. I'll lead you in this prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you offer me new life. I thank you that you lived the life of full obedience I cannot live. And you died on the cross for my sin. That you dealt with my rebellion. And you offer me full forgiveness because you spilled your blood. I thank you that you're alive. You broke free from death. And I want you to enter my life as my Lord, as my forgiver, as my rescuer, 
as my Savior. Jesus, come and get me. Change me. Fill me with your love and your presence. And if you prayed that prayer this morning, I invite you to lift your hand. Lift your hand. God bless you. God bless you. I'd like to pray for you. And if you took that very first stumbling step to Jesus, God bless you. I can see you way at the back. Thank you so much. Let someone know here because they want to come alongside you and encourage you in a journey with Jesus, an adventure that starts this morning and continues forward. Lord, we thank you for those who said yes to you this morning. And we pray that they would know your salvation, your power, your presence, your forgiveness, the joy of the Lord would be their strength and you would mold and shape them into men and women after your heart. Lord, give them the capacity to connect with good friends here so that they can grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Amen. Okay, good news. So I'm getting instructions here because I'm the clueless Scotsman. Uh, we'd love to meet you. We've got a gift for you if you prayed uh, that prayer. Uh, we've got a, you can come with a friend and come with others because I'm going to give a second shout out this morning, if you want a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit, a fresh release, a fresh impartation, or you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, I want to invite you to come forward. So let's stand. All of us stand. That makes it easier for us to move along. And you want to receive the laying on of hands. You want Jesus to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. You want a fresh infusion of Holy Spirit life. Then I invite you to come forward. If you prayed that prayer, inviting Jesus into your life. Our friends are standing there and they've got a couple of packs that they want to share with you. So that's there as a gift to help you on the journey. But let's make space for God. You can have a Holy Spirit encounter right here this morning. Fresh fire, fresh impartation, fresh touch from the Lord. Jason and the crew are going to lead us in a song. But don't be shy and bashful. Come forward. Come out here into this space. We declare it holy ground where heaven and earth come closer together. And we invite you to meet with Jesus, the unique dispenser of the Holy Spirit who wants to pour his grace and his power into your life in a transforming way, in a beautiful way. You come as we sing.